Hi, everybody. I'm Derek Hepanegro, and I'm the creative director of Schumacher. And we are so lucky today because we have Kit Kemp, the creative director of the Firmdale Hotels, with us today. Um, I haven't met uh, Kit before, but I feel um, so fortunate to be with you today, Kit. So welcome to Deep Dive. Um, you are our second guest. Last week, we had Thomas O'Brien. And really, we're um, meeting with the experts, um, learning about specific things. You know, this is really meant to be a learning exercise for the people who are here joining us today and who are mostly interior designers. I know you have a lot of fans out there. I happen to be a huge fan. Um, I, when we were talking before, I was telling you that I've stayed in at least 10 of your properties and loved each one um, so much, I keep coming back, um, which I think is a really great sign. Um, and Kit is also, if you don't know, she's, um, she has a textile business, she has product, you know, does many different kinds of um, product design, and she um, is also a champion of British craft. So welcome, Kit. Thank you, I'm so delighted to be one of your guests. Thank you. So um, I learned a little bit just now, but can you tell everybody how you got started in the business, the hotel business? Um, yes, it was. Um, I, I worked for a, a very charismatic architect called Leszek Nowitzki. He was a pre-war Pole. He found his way to England via Siberia and down through Palestine and then to the UK. And he was the one person who would give me an opportunity. And because he was such a character, uh, his clients were also very, very interesting. And one of them was my future husband, Tim Kemp. Mm -hmm. And uh, his projects were very small, but he was very practical and he really got on with them. And one of his first, he, he had student hotels and he would link with the Richmond College, which was an American college. And, there, and the students would come over and stay in his hotels. So they were very uh, sort of two star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but the students like them so they must have I mean they they were they stylish in some way they must have been uh, no they weren't incredibly stylish but there were um, that they had lots of character because there'd be lots of guitar playing and we were very young and um, then of course when we got together we decided that maybe we would try and upgrade one of them when Tim managed to get a freehold building that's fun that's and that was Dorset Square. So that was our very first building. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you walk into a Kit Kemp hotel, I mean, your signature is definitely on it. There's no doubt. But they all look very, very different. You know, Crosby Street Hotel in New York is very different than number 16 in London. Um, can you tell us how you put your stamp on them? Or, or, you know, what are the attributes of your stamp? And how do you translate it to different properties? Uh, well, it does depend on the size. Crosby Street, of course, was a new build in Soho in New York, and uh, it was a fabulous uh, uh, a spot to actually be building, and that has about 90 rooms. Uh, whereas number 16 is um, architecturally early 19th century stucco building, about three or four in a row, and that's an old building. So sometimes we're working with new builds, and sometimes we're working with uh, just architecturally interesting buildings. And each project will have um, it, its different sort of things that you have to look out for. But mainly I'm known for my craft, uh, loving art, um, always wanting to show a lot of craft, uh, commissioning lots of makers and an individual approach. I don't like large companies. I like to work with smaller individual people. And if something's handcrafted, it's always different, even if they make the same thing over and over again. And you love color too, right? I mean, that's something that I get from you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we're not. We're not scared of a bit of color. We like actually a lot of color. And um, although, yes, here we can see Crosby Street, and here it's the art. So we've got a Jaume Plenser, uh, a Jack Milroy, a Callum Innes, and there's an Anselm Kiefer, and outside is a Botero. So fabulous artists. And actually, I was able to buy a few of them when they were starting off. And it's wonderful to see now that they have blossomed into really world-class artists and sculptors. And at the Crosby Street, there's, there are a lot of dogs also, right? Paintings of dogs and 
Am I getting Well, the funny thing was that uh, it's it's a new build. And when I first went to New York, uh, I wanted to have the inspiration for the Crosby Street as art inspired by the written word. But in fact, when I went and walked around Crosby Street and that area, I just saw so many different dogs. And (laughs) I always thought, my goodness, where are they all living in these high rise buildings and in this city atmosphere? So I asked my uh, design team to go into the streets and take lots of pictures of dogs and I wanted to have fabulous high heel shoes and then the dog but in fact everybody in New York was wearing flip-flops because it was very hot and summery and very hard underfoot but um, anyway that's how the dogs somehow involve themselves into the design. (laughs) New Yorkers do love their dogs. New Yorkers are French it's funny. I mean sure I'm sure people in London love dogs too. They do yeah, yeah without doubt. And in fact, I was just doing, um, I was just lucky enough to be involved in Susanna Salk's book, Designers and Their Dogs. Yes. <laughs> okay. Such a great one. She's a talented yeah. lady. Also, so how do you, um, well, here's number 16. So maybe you can walk us through this. So this is so different than Crosby Street. Yes, of course. And I mean, the thing is that uh, it's all about an English country garden here. And number 16 Um, we're lucky enough to have this outdoor space and so you could have marriages and christenings but also because it's a stucco building uh, you're working with nooks and crannies within an existing building and fireplaces and uh, rooms that interlink to one another and I like every area to have its distinct character because it then makes the place seem even larger but this is a lovely green garden and here is a fabulous Schumacher fabric on the headboard um, of this particular bedroom at number 16. I love that. So that's our Kitsugi fabric. So thank you for joining us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you interpreted it. I love it. I love it so much. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Mm -hmm. So when when you um, are working on a hotel, where do you start? I mean, it seems like such an, an onerous undertaking. Like, what is your starting point? Well, I mean, you always start off with uh, butterflies in your tummy because uh, if it's a new build, um, you haven't got anything. If you're working with an old building, at least you've got uh, got architectural detail that you want to maybe preserve um, and you can walk around the building. But if it's a new build and um, if you are the actual owner, which we are of our buildings, then we have to work from in a sense, the light. So we want to have very large windows. Also, just to make sure that the roots within the hotel for all the different, um, for housekeeping, for events, for the kitchens, all that inside area works. And then once that starts working, then I can work out how my spaces are going to look really beautiful. And sometimes I can't think about the main lobby area. So I'll do various bedrooms and maybe a hallway and then build up and build up. And then once you get an idea under your belt, you're up and running and it's really exciting then. And you're able to commission artists. You bring in your favorite uh, uh, sort of uh, people that you like to work with and design with. And um, it then starts to become real teamwork. Mm -hmm. that is so much of the joy of it I mean that's one of my favorite things in my in my job is just working with my teams right I mean it just brings so much you know everyone brings so much to the table so well one of the things that I think is so unique about your work is you're able to straddle you know fun and joy with a sophistication and also there's a coziness but there's also tons of style those are hard things to bridge I think you know um Joyfulness and sophistication don't always go together or style and warmth don't always go together. So I think that's a really unique aspect of your work for me. It's, it's interesting because I love folk art um, and I like folk art from every, all around the world, whether it's Guatemala or India or you know, anywhere else in South America or England. Um, and there's a difference because you don't want it to be childlike. It, had to, it has to have a sophistication. It has to be very grown up at the same time. So there's always that balance between a sort of lyricism and joy in the design, but at the same time, the sophistication and something which is actually going to last. I don't really like design, which I would say wears high heel shoes. I, I like the, it to be a lasting look, one mm-hmm. that you can build on. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. 
So we know you love craft and art. Tell us about some of the charities that you've been um, working on. Well, uh, one, I suppose the main charity is Fine Cell Work, and that is working with uh, prisoners. And we work within 32 different prisons. And it, it's a way of helping the inmates to not reoffend. They are actually earning money, and they earn very good money, and they're learning a skill. And if at the end of it they can learn to reupholster then a piece of furniture, then it means that they also have a craft that they can continue with. So what we have done is design uh, some ranges that they can do. And one is rain shadow, which is one of the cushions that you can see on that sofa. Um, and then we, we wanted to get interior designers involved. So we created um, a headboard and an embroidered footstool, and actually even a mirror which has embroidery around it, and then embellishing uh, fabrics uh, from uh, Blythefield, uh, their Peggy Angus designs. So we, we've done actually a lot with fine cell wood, and, and we're continuing to do so. Uh, you can just see here that's rain shadow, and rain shadow for us was just the falling leaves, maybe in the, just after the rain, so you get a lovely sort of glitter to it. Uh -huh. And on the left is a, a Blythefield fabric where we've just taken a normal fabric but then embellished it with chain stitch and running stitch and French knots. So how does it work? You, um, you're teaching them a craft and then you sell the product through your website? Yeah, we sell, we sell for them. But not only that, we had something very interesting just earlier this year, just before lockdown, and we had asked some very famous artists whether they would put forward some designs that they would allow the prisoners to do. And if they liked the work at the end, that they, they would sign the, the actual piece of work and uh, we, we sold it at Sotheby's. And uh, one of the artists we asked was Ai Weiwei, who of course is one of the leading artists well known in the world. And he in fact had been imprisoned in China. So one of the first things he asked was could, that they had to be doing it of their own volition. And secondly, that they would be paid. And then he gave us the most incredibly difficult, huge piece of work to do, which was um, a, a great big wall hanging, which had sort of prisoners and people hauling people from the sea and um, bringing in refugees, etc., which took over a year to do. And finally, um, we, it was sold along with other artworks and made a, a fantastic amount of money for the prisoners. So we felt that that was really worthwhile. Do the, do the prisoners get the money when they come when they're released or do does it just go back into the program no they they actually get paid for all their work and anything which is additional will then go because we've also started out of the gates now so that when they uh, leave prison there's somewhere safe that they can go and they can continue um, their learning process and and sometimes it's very difficult when you just leave prison to be left on your to your own devices so this is working very well that is so fabulous. That is so fabulous. We need to adopt something like that in the United States. And um, have you met some of the prisoners, you know, once oh, they've been yeah. released? And yeah. No, no, no. I've met them in prison and, and when they've been released as well. I mean, obviously not all of them, but mm -hmm. a lot of them. And uh, it's, it's mainly men. It's not women. And, you know, I just remember Elvis, there was one of the guys, he's, he's about six foot seven, and he's got hands which are so huge, and you think, my goodness, he's never going to be able to do anything. But actually, his work is fine and very, very beautiful, and he's done work also for, you know, within churches with surpluses and altar cloths, and um, it, it has turned his life around. Wow, that is just incredible. That's incredible. Very <laughs> inspiring. Um, okay, so going back to hotel design, um, do you have any personal hotel design pet peeves? Um, yes. One is when you arrive in a hotel and you're just going up to the reception desk and they all turn away to another direction. And uh, I mean, you should be welcomed in a hotel. And I just, I just remember being there late at night and there was some very weary traveler coming in. And, um, and suddenly there was this little voice from behind our desk at Crosby Street saying, uh, hello and welcome to the Crosby Street Hotel. And you could see him sort of put back his shoulders and actually try and look and see who was saying it because it was one of our receptionists called Lottie, who's only about four foot 11. And honestly, she could only see her nose above the reception desk, oh. but it made a huge difference. And so we always say, you know, you, there should be a welcome. Mm. And also sort of too many wires all around the room and too much plastic so those are my 
but those are my real bugs. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> and I'm assuming when you're designing, so you know, you have a perspective, you have a very um, singular perspective, but um, what do you, you know, I mean, you must look through your guest lens also, right, when you're designing? Yes, I mean, gosh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm mainly looking through the guest lens because I, I try and look at myself as no more than a guest. And uh, as a guest, you really don't want to know what's going on behind the scenes. If you're having an event, you shouldn't hear what's going on in the next room. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, all the thing about a hotel is that every different area has to work extremely well. It's all very well having a beautiful room, but if it takes three quarters of an hour for your breakfast to come, or there, there are other things that are worrying you about the service, you're not going to enjoy it. So it's, it's actually an all round thing. And although my part of it is design, uh, I am so involved in, in everything else as well to, make, to try and make sure that it, it works as smoothly as possible. And actually you probably have to be a complete masochist to do what we do because there's always gonna be something. <laughs> and when you least want that to happen. <laughs> So what do you think about the trend toward like, you know, technology where you order your, your uh, food on an iPad and, you know, there seems to be less human connection or um, I was in one hotel in Los Angeles where it was so hard to figure out how the lights work. How do you, oh my goodness. yeah, oh my goodness. How, how does that, fact, how does technology factor into your, into your hotel? Do you know, I mean, it's, so, I mean, I do agree with you because some of these systems, you need to have some kind of degree in technology to actually work the whole system. And you end up not even switching on the television because it's too complicated. And of course, I mean, I'm at an age where there weren't all these things before. So I find it doubly difficult. I usually have to ask my children, but there's nothing ever going to take away from that one-to-one -one meeting that person who's, you know, delivering your, your room service or making your bed. And you can say, I hate all the corners tucked in because my feet just can't budge. Please leave them out. You know, it's learning little things like that about your guests that make all the difference. So, I mean, that's what you're really striving for. Right, right. Um, okay, so talk about the small things. So I've been in some of your, oh, well, first of all, I love your hotel bathrooms. I love that they're all different. I love that, you know, they're really designed for the space. They're charming, especially at number 16. I mean, I've stayed at many rooms there and each bathroom is different and I get such a kick out of it. And they're also comfortable. So tell us about, you know, how far you go in your design what you know because you're a woman of, of incredible taste and i'm sure you have opinions about the toiletries and all those things yeah i do and it's amazing how it just grows organically so um i wasn't a product designer but over the years i have sub i have become one and that because I'm interested in the perfumes of the toiletries, how I wanted the packaging done, and because I've designed so many different fabrics, I could then, it's very interesting to do, um, uh, to design something in one metier and then take it to another. So to design a fabric or an embroidery and then put it and making it as part of a, a packaging for a perfume toiletry, whether it be a soap or um, a shampoo or a conditioner, and equally, I, I, I wanted to create our own crockery. So that also was taking what, uh, two of our designs. Uh, one is called Sailor's Farewell. And it's, uh, it's a lady saying farewell to her sailor husband. And it's his adventures that he's having above and below the waterline um, and desert islands and dogs in a little uh, ship at sea and the frogman way down below. So, I mean, I have, we have a lot of fun designing these things and uh, it really has added to everything that I'm doing, including napkins. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about what other product extensions do you have? You have napkins, you have china, you have, yeah. you have beauty like shampoo and conditioner and things like that? Yeah, all the shampoos, conditioners and soaps. And then of course our furniture because um, over the years there's, uh, various sort of uh, pieces of furniture that people have loved and asked for. So now with the, with the shop kit Kemp, we're able to do that. So our handle chairs are terribly popular. And then our chairs, which have a little pocket in the side. And um, so various things that, that uh, we've enjoyed actually creating and organically have grown over the years. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, do people come in and say, you know, they stay in a hotel room and they, they're like, I want that room, I have to have that room. Have you received that kind of inquiry and ha have you been able to fulfill the whole thing? Do they need to hire you as an interior designer? How does that work? No, no, I just do it, gosh. Um, I mean, I'm thrilled <laughs> if they do. And we have done that and we've sent to all over the world from Russia through to sort of Europe and the continent. Um, so yes, no, I'm thrilled to do that. And I'm very happy to do it without a design fee. <laughs> oh, fabulous, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So one of the things that's always intrigued me about your designs, oh, and there are some of your-, your, um, your Yeah, um, you can see how we've used traveling light and ozone and rickrack and friendly flowers, all uh, as different packaging. Mm -hmm. um, so that has been really fun to do and it makes it more colorful and interesting. Mm -hmm. So fun. And I've used your shampoo. I think the last time I stayed at um, Charlotte Street Hotel, I ordered your shampoo for a year or something like that. It's really fabulous. Um, yes. Okay, so one of your signature, um, one of the signature things that you do in your hotel rooms is you do very tall headboards. And I'm just curious how you landed on that that idea and usually they're covered in incredible fabrics you know so unique and can you tell us a little bit about that process yes I can because uh, what happens is where you've got the most glorious fabric and then it gets all sort of curled and creased up into curtains um, and you, you are not able to see the beautiful design and, and there are so many fabulous designers creating wonderful fabrics and so we actually thought gosh if you've got a high headboard it's actually uh, works as a sort of showpiece for that particular fabric so that's how it started and then the shapes got more curious and more interesting and then we thought gosh there are so many wonderful artists why don't we ask artists to actually create different headboards and that's how it's evolved here you can see uh, one of Schumacher's under the sea uh, mm -hmm. fabrics that we saw and we thought oh my goodness that's so great but how can we use it and uh, so we thought actually as a headboard for a Caribbean suite what could be more appropriate and what's so much fun and then beside the bed we could find um, a, a, a lamp which has sort of crabs and shells and things on it and so this this sort of curious shell and different shapes and uh, a wonderful sort of Caribbean parrot which is a, a wall lamp all starts coming together and that's when it really becomes fun to start to design and decorate. Mm -hmm. That's amazing I mean each one is such a unique conversation piece and I think it must really I mean I think it changes the way a room feels right? Absolutely and at these two uh, this is um, on the, the one on the left which is the dark headboard with the red horse that is uh, from Russian folk art and I had this black lacquer box which had uh, a similar design on and so I showed it to Kumi who's half Japanese and her mother sends over lots of sort of old kimonos and so she could create that fabulous headboard and the one on the right is by someone called Natasha Hulse and my goodness that is a work of art that is all hand embroidered and embellished and beaded um, and I mean it's just the most beautiful headboard uh, which I couldn't resist putting in one of our top suites at Ham Yard in London. Incredible. So obviously these things are not high performance right I mean they don't have um, 50,000 double rugs or how well, do actually, you having, no, having said that these are both on a boiled wool and uh, I mean I have a sofa at home which is six years old and we've got five dogs which sit on it daily and you know it's the most amazing um, I mean it's still looking good so I, I mean you're always very much aware of, uh, of back cloths and what you can use and, and sometimes I say oh hey I've just got to do that and I think it's not going to last long but other times I, I really am aware of how long things should last. <laughs> so you pick and choose. I right. do a bit. I do a bit. Sometimes the, the fabrics are just so beautiful that it's just worth it for, you know, just a couple of years. Right. Yeah. It helps that you own the hotel <laughs> because you Absolutely. don't have to answer to anybody. Yeah, right. no, no, no. I can give myself a sack and reinstate myself the next day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any other signature, um, signature ideas that you use in your, in your installation, in your hotel installations? 
Yeah, we always have our uh, mannequins in the room, which are sort of life-size mannequins. And we've got very shapely Edwardian shapes. So there's a lovely bust and there's a lovely bottom. And we always use our fabrics on them, which are also related to the room. And people put their coats on them and put their hats on them. And it's a sculptural piece in the room. Um, so um, I think that's something that we're also known for. Uh -huh. And do you find that, um, so you have eight hotels in the UK or L London, I guess, right? And two in New York. Um, does your, does, is, the is the sense of color in both locations different? The light, it's so extraordinary, it's so very, very interesting. I mean, uh, in, the, in the UK, I, I love um, the work of Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant, who were Bloomsbury artists uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, because their use of color is so good in a British light. Mm. And then you get an, um, a, a Mediterranean light, and then you get a Caribbean light, and then in New York, you'll actually get a bit of both because in summer it's very, very bright and then in winter it can be very cold and gray. Um, so you're, yes, you're looking at very different things. And actually it's quite interesting because when I was doing the crockery for Sailor's Farewell, um, uh, I, I actually had it sent out to the Caribbean and looked at it in that light and it was going green and it didn't look good. So it's very important that some of your colors are actually able to be used almost everywhere. And I'm aware of that too. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So tell us a little bit about new construction versus old construction. You know, so um, I've heard designers say that new construction is much easier. You don't have as many limitations. Do you agree with that? And are you ever, if so, are you ever, you know, um, likely to pass on an older, older building because of that? No, I mean, I'm always saying to uh, my husband, why on earth can't we get a sort of architecturally just fabulous gem? And then it would be so easy to, uh, to actually just work within it and make it look more beautiful. I think a new build is very, very difficult in a way. I mean, you can, the, the, the rooms can be the larger size, etc., and you can work with the light, but to actually get the character from the word go, uh, to make it look as if it's meant to be, uh, to make it, feel comfortable from the word go, I think is very difficult. And uh, I mean, that is challenging. So uh, an old building, you're working with uh, uh, sometimes very confined spaces, so you have lots of nooks and crannies. A new building might be uh, sort of rather more of a square shape, but doesn't have that character. Uh -huh. mm. And are the codes very different in New York and London? Oh, hey, the codes everywhere are hard. Health mm. and safety, uh, just trying to get any building completed. Um, there are moments where you're tearing your hair out. Um, but I mean, that's the name of the game. If you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and you know, the other saying we always say is, if you've got to make an omelet, you've got, if you make an omelet, you've got to break an egg. And that's the building process because nobody likes the building process. Your neighbors, nobody likes it. It's, you're making noise, you're making dust, you're making dirt and rubble, but it has, you've got to go through that process. I love all your sayings. They're fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to write this down. They're really good. Um, have you made any expensive mistakes? Uh, well, I don't like admitting to them. And uh, the fact is that I have a very big budget, but I can't make huge mistakes. I mean, I have ordered lots of furniture once, which actually just never arrived. Um, and that, that, was a, that was an expensive mistake that I made. Um, and I, I think once you've started, you, once you've made a mistake like that, you start to put a lot of different things in place and contracts in place so that um, nobody is gonna have, um, you know, get really worried. <laughs> Learn from it all, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your new book. Oh, uh, well, Design Thread was the last book. Mm -hmm. And Design Thread uh, is my third book that I've, I've made. And I'm working on a fourth one now. But the third one, uh, the Design Thread is lovely because it really just goes through and tells everyone about the makers that I use, uh, the people that I like to work with, 
uh, the spaces and how we create them. And it's not just the room, but it's the areas that lead into other spaces because those are also very, very important and to get them to coordinate, but not look the same. If everything is very much the same, sort of gray in one room and gray in the next, you're out the other side before you've had an experience. If you can get your hallway or inside a cupboard or a landing or a length of view, which is extremely interesting, then you're making uh, your, your, your whole area come to life. And, um, and even if you can get the most jaded business person who isn't actually interested in their surroundings to ask you questions, that's a good feeling. Well, I love the fact that you give so much credit to the people that you work with. Not everybody does that. So I think that's um, very generous and wonderful. And then Design Thread is also a blog, right? You Yes, yeah, we, um, my, I sit down with my design team once a week on a Wednesday and it's like a sort of show and tell. We have out and about, day to day, what we're doing. And uh, we've been having creativity and self-isolation, which has been absolutely amazing with collages, embroideries, making soap, you name it. Everybody <laughs> has done it, block printing. It's been fabulous. And the do's and don'ts of design and so what we've decided to do is that we've got such a fabulous back catalogue now that we thought we'd make it into another book of the do's and don'ts, meet the makers mm -hmm. and day to day because it's been so fascinating to actually have um, a view of what the workshops look like of our picture framer, of our painter, of our ceramicist. Mm -hmm. And I love to look behind the scenes. It's, it's, you know, it's that curiosity again. And um, so we thought we'd try and make that into another book. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I think the don'ts are so important. One of my frustrations as a magazine editor was, you know, seeing, seeing money spent so poorly, you know, where someone would hire a designer and you'd be like, oh my God, that costs so much money. And it's not what it should be. And, you know, magazines show the do's, but they don't show the don'ts. And it's hard to show the don'ts without offending people. But, yes. and I still haven't figured out that. I do think it's a very important, you know, a very important message. I do. And uh, I think it's the most helpful thing for not only just everybody, but for designers as well. The don'ts are just as important as the do's. Right. And yeah, so, so yeah, so we try and make it evens and, uh, and try and work out which is which. So I, I was just the guest editor for Homes and Gardens uh, for the June issue, which we'd been working on actually since Christmas time. So that was actually fun to actually do the do's and don'ts there and answer questions on Instagram of, of people's design mistakes. Mm. It, I mean, you know, it's hard to get it right. I mean, yes. I, I, you know, have renovated several houses and I decorate all the time and I, you know, it's, you don't always get it right. And it's expensive <laughs> as we it know. Is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the other thing is that you can look at plans and you can absolutely uh, design to the last uh, sort of cupboard and, and shelf or piece of furniture going into the room. And then when it goes in, you think, hey, hang on a minute, that doesn't look right. And so I think there's a lot always of thinking on your feet. And mm. sometimes, you know, even the best laid plans don't quite work out as they should do. And so you have to be aware of that and move things around. And sometimes the, the things that have been a slight mistake work out to be your really great triumphs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can see that, I can see that. I know, so we all have to be nimble as we've learned over the past several months on so okay. many so um how often do you redecorate your hotels um every three to five years and we have a running program so we don't shut the hotels uh my my myself and my design team will um my design team look after various buildings and i edit the designs and sometimes do a complete one but um so about it, so for example as we opened the Whitby, we had just about completed redoing every room at the Crosby Street Hotel. And I presume actually, as we open the Warren Street Hotel in a 18 months time, we'll have to do the same at the Whitby. And it, it's a rolling program. 
And I, I think that's the joy actually of having a living space and a living building. It's not just keeping it exactly the same for the next seven years. It is how you move that forward and keep the whole space living and new and feeling fresh. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, okay, and so you have two new projects, or you have several new projects coming up in New York City, right? You have Bergdorf's? Yeah, Bergdorf's, well, Bergdorf's uh, have, you know, with the, with the pandemic have had a really tough time as well. So we were going to be doing a restaurant there, but that has been put back. But I, I think hopefully it will at some point go forward. And then also we'll be doing a space for later on this year in the building. And then of course, Warren Street Hotel, which is uh, another large project. And then we've been doing um, a whole lighting collection for a company called Porta Romana that we've been working on. Oh, and then with um, Christopher Farr doing some more weaves uh, mm -hmm. that we've been uh, working on. Um, so various projects are in the pipeline. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. So tell us, what advice would you have for an interior designer um, wanting to break into the hospitality business? Um, well, I, I get lots of lovely letters from people who want to join. And uh, some I can't consider because they haven't got the right background. Um, and age is never into, in, uh, comes into it. I, I like every age group. Um, but what I would say is to get me to look twice, don't just write a letter, but also put in a scheme, put in your favorite fabrics, put it in a space. It doesn't have to be a space that you know, one that you would love to have. And I want to see how you work your fabrics, how you work your space, how your mind moves, whether you've actually created something new to go in it. And then you whet my appetite and I say, gosh, I've got to see that person. <laughs> Great advice, really great advice. All right, and my last question, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience for questions and answers, if that's okay with you. Um, so obviously COVID has not been easy to navigate. What's helped you get through the crisis? Well, actually the design blog, because all our ideas for creativity and self-isolation, first of all, my design team have just been absolutely amazing and coming up with lots of things that they've been doing at home, whether it's flower pressing or collage or whatever. Ruby um, Keen, who's in New York, has been just fantastic with her creativity. Um, and um, also the response that we get from uh, people who've looked at our work and, um, you know, they say, oh, I've got this great idea. Let's do this. Da, da, da. So it's actually all the time. I think because um, I've been the tastemaker for Christie's as well, because Christie's, the auction house, has had to go virtual too. So they asked me to choose 10 fabulous pieces of furniture and silver and ceramics and how I would use them in a space. So that's been really fun doing that. So all the time I'm getting a response for different things and that really has kept us going. That's fantastic. And now you're busy again, right? Because your hotels have started to open. Can you just refresh my memory and tell me um, what's open so far and what's about to open? Yes, yeah, so Crosby Street, July the 10th, we opened. And of course the outdoor space, because we've got that lovely little sculpture garden and outside area. Um, and then the Whitby is opening on the 1st of August and we're starting to open with sort of lovely things like doing uh, an art tour and making it 101 fabulous things to do in New York. And um, so that's, that, that's the Crosby and the Whitby. And then in London, Ham Yard, uh, the apartments have been open and we're opening the hotel next week. The restaurant and the outdoor space there has been opened. We hope to open a couple more in September and then have the whole lot open by November. And I have to say that's a day-to-day -day thing. We just don't know from minute to minute. Um, and some days we feel very happy and other days we feel as if we're, you know, very unhappy. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to contend with, but it's yeah. doing, uh, dealing with it brilliantly. So, all right, so I'm gonna just open it up to questions. Um, so here's one with so many mattresses out now what mattress do you use and has it changed well we use something called it's a company called sleep easy and uh and in fact we bought so many mattresses that they nicknamed it or they called it 
the, the Firmdale Beauty Rest. And I mean, that has to be a great name. <laughs> and so that, these, those are the mattresses that we use and it's called a Firmdale Beauty Rest and it's by a company called Sleep Easy. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for sharing your secrets. Um, here's another one. What was the inspiration behind Whitby, Whitby Hotel in New York City compared to Crosby Street, uptown versus downtown? Um, well, uh, I think I mentioned that Crosby Street was, it was going to be all about art inspired by the written word. And then the dogs somehow got into the mix. And what I wanted to do for Midtown and at the Whitby was it can be terribly serious up there and very sort of business-like and serious. And that we actually want it to, to be colorful as you open that door and then just entering the world that we actually know and understand. And above the uh, reception desk, is a, a fantastic sort of loom artwork by Hermani Sky, And um, uh, uh, so that is our love of the loom and our love of fabrics, which we do. I mean, it's the most exciting part of my year, seeing the new collections. And I'm never happier than sitting on the floor surrounded by beautiful fabrics. So uh, that's also what we wanted to introduce. It was a lovely opportunity to, for me to use many of my new fabrics that were coming out at that time as well. And of course, our love of color and our love of the folk art. And Joe Tilson was an artist that we absolutely adored. He was um, a pop artist in the 70s. We felt that he'd been rather ignored. And so we could say, enjoy Joe, uh, Joe Tilson. So we bought a lot of his work. And in fact, he's got a fabulous following now. So that's great. <laughs> okay. okay. So here's a question about the linen spray at number 16. Where can that be purchased? Good old shop kit camp. And yeah. um, uh, you know, the fabulous thing is that um, with this pandemic, we've, uh, we've been so happy to have our online. And in fact, our pillow sprays have been incredibly popular. So uh, please, yes, um, <laughs> we'd love you to order some. <laughs> I'm going on right after this, I think. All right. So another question, in turning over so frequently, three to five years, what do you do with all of those furnishings? Well, you know, we've just had a, a sale in uh, London and we're going to do a pop up, I think, also in the States. Um, and it's true because when we refurbish, we might change the shape of a chair. Um, there are certain pieces of furniture and certain things that we're not using again. And there'll be sofa beds and uh, television tables and all kinds of things like that. So we literally just in the last uh, 10 days had um, a sale in London. Um, so um, we, we should watch this space because we'll be doing one in New York too. Okay, yeah. good. Um, someone has a question about cheating. Um, what do you look for? 100% cotton, sateen, percale, bamboo. Do you have a favorite? Um, well, uh, for our for our toiletries, we're you, we're getting away from any sort of plastics, and it's it's a, a polymer, but it's it's actually a bamboo. So we're using a lot of bamboo and we've done a lot of research and a lot of work. One of our uh, directors called Jessica Black has spent the last sort of year and a half, two years, actually really looking into the ecology side of what we're doing. I mean, even our slippers, I think, are biodegradable. <laughs> and um, so it goes on from there. But as far as fabrics are concerned, there's nothing like a natural fabric. And I love natural linens, even though they crease. Uh, I love a cotton percale because it lasts and uh, takes a color really well. Uh, for upholstery, there's nothing better than a weave because the rubs are so much higher. And so we're always using uh, fabulous weaves there. And, um, and then our use of embroidery too, because there's nothing like something which looks like it's done by hand. And so depending upon the design, for example, um, I'm just doing something for the Theatre Royal Drury Lane in London, which is going to be reopening. It's a wonderful theatre. And so they asked us whether we would design the crockery and everything for afternoon tea there. So we're doing lots of mythical characters of people that were on the stage. And that will make a wonderful embroidery. So I shall also then turn it over and do a fabric as well. So it's, there are lots of different things. and. Um, and then, of course, lighting, we've done wonderful sort of doggy lamps where we've used wonderful old ikat shades and things like that. You know, there are so many fabulous things that I'm dying to do. <laughs> Never out of ideas. 
Hmm. All right, here's another question. When redecorating and repurposing for your own home on a somewhat tight budget, where do you suggest focusing most of one's efforts? I think you no need to go for really expensive fabrics. You can go for, um, uh, in England, there's this great shop called the Cloth Shop, and you can buy linens there for, you know, eight or ten pounds. And then what you can do is you can just have a really fabulous uh, trim going down the leading edge. And by using, um, and then if it is, a, if, if you just think, if you just fall in love with the most fabulous fabric, use it on a footstool or use it on an area um, or even just a headboard um, where uh, you can make the most of that and then everything around it can be much, much simpler. And in fact, you know, it's, it's like a concerto, it's like music. You have your, your, your sort of perfect bit, the, the crescendo, and then everything else around it can fall away. And by using contrast as well. So if everything is the same color, it sort of merges in. But if you want something to stand out, contrast it against something else. That's fabulous advice and a wonderful analogy. <laughs> Um, any hotel design books you'd recommend for educational purposes? Oh gosh, design uh, books. Well, I love the work of Chester Jones. Um, and uh, he's at the end of his sort of career now. I love the work of Robert Kine. I would look him up immediately. I adore Bunny Williams and uh, Charlotte Moss. I mean, there are so many fabulous designers that we really have to, you know, take our hat off to and really enjoy their work. And uh, one English designer, William Yeowood, who just very sadly died mm -hmm. earlier this year, uh, 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 his work and his books are, are fabulous. And he was always such a wonderful, irascible character apart from everything else. So we just loved him and we miss him a lot. For sure. Yeah. All right. And then I have regards to you from Sandy Weisenthal. It's so great to see you, Kit. I think. Oh, you, lovely. When I look at my beautiful Peter Clark pieces based on visits to your hotels. So you really influence somebody. Well, Peter Clark is um, a wonderful artist who uses collage. And we, we, I found him in Charlotte Street, just by the Charlotte Street Hotel. And I was sort of in my car at the traffic lights and I looked in this gallery window and I saw one of his works so I just parked the car went in and fell in love with with his work um, and um, and I have got to know him since then he's become a good friend and in fact his latest book I just did the frontispiece uh, and wording for him uh, so I'm thrilled that somebody else is really enjoying his work too yeah that's great Okay, and what is your next vacation destination when people are traveling, once people are traveling again? Um, well, I, the next place I'm going to actually is Biarritz because there's a wonderful artist there called Mimi. And Mimi is in her 70s and she's a tiny little person, looks like a sparrow, but actually she's got so many ideas. <laughs> and uh, whenever I go there, I, I feel exhausted because she just, says and you must see this and we must do that and da 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 and I, I just think you know if I could possibly be like her in a few years time I'll be thrilled I'll be very happy and so I want to go and see Mimi and I want to make sure that during this pandemic and everything else she's been you know feeling as good as she should. Mm. Yeah. I have a question for you um, outside of your own hotels do you have a favorite hotel? I can't possibly. Oh, outside my own hotel. I was going to say, don't ask me to choose my own. Yeah. Um, well, do you know what? I love hotels for very different reasons. I mean, I love a big grand hotel like the Hotel du Palais, which is in Biarritz, because it was owned by the principality. And so uh, somehow it could be terribly grand without actually thinking of the cost. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, when you went down to breakfast, I always felt like I was on the Titanic. You know, this room was, had great big uh, seas lashing in all around it. It was absolutely glorious. And then um, actually in France again, uh, the Hotel Yaka, which is in a little cobbled street going down to Saint-Tropez. And literally you hear all the traffic going by. There are screeching of, <laughs> of scooters and uh, my husband and I are not incredibly tall, but we went into one of the bedrooms and literally you had to crouch like this when you went to the window and there was hardly anywhere to put all your soaps and things. But when you looked out the window and you saw all the rooftops, you felt like a student again. 
So, um, I mean, there are lots of different reasons of, as to why you love staying in different places. Yeah. <laughs> That's charming. Okay. Um, someone once, you know, when I was at Domino, we did this thing called the, the Little Black Book. And we asked designers for tips and things. And um, David Netto said, if you put your bed on the floor, you'll feel 20 years younger, which I thought was such a funny <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried that. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of camping. Yeah. Um, okay. I think I'll just ask you one more question. How do you balance color? Oh, balance color. Now that is it. Um, I mean, I'm balancing. It's all about balance. It's so funny because when I'm, when I'm working with my designers and I'm trying to edit their work and they're learning, the most difficult thing for them is balance. And you can almost just see it yourself when you're doing it. I see it myself. I find it difficult to edit other people's work, actually, because I visualize what I'm doing. And because sometimes I'm bending the rules, uh, you have to be even more careful with balance. Otherwise, it doesn't look great. But um, I, again, uh, I will use the same. I, I will use different colors. And if you're looking through a door, you know, if you've got green in the room, there might be just yellow outside. And then you look for the orange and there's that tone of blue so that you've got a kind of perspective of um, in front of you, a middle distance and a depth. And it's the same actually when you're designing a fabric, you don't want it to look too flat. You want to have a, 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 a one in front, a middle and a depth all the time, because that actually just brings life to your fabric or life into your interiors. And um, I know that's actually not very helpful, but I will, I mean, that, that's just kind of, I don't know if that is helpful, is it? I think that is helpful. <laughs> I mean, I think those kinds of things are very hard to articulate. And I think that, that does, that's a great, um, uh, you know, a great um, structure to think about. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, it was so fabulous having you on. Thank you so much. It was really an honor and a pleasure, and I look forward to seeing more of you. I really appreciate it. Well, it was an honor for me as well. And, you know, I've been, I've used so many Schumacher fabrics and uh, love working with, in the States. So um, thank you. It was, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing all of your new projects. Thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you in person. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I can't wait for that. All right. Okay. So All much. right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. -bye.